Masters of the Shadow, where I, Cardinal Sin, take you right to the source of the most important genre creators of generation. Authors, actors, directors, science fiction, fantasy, comics, film, and other creators that shape our genre fiction and entertainment. Get ready to leave the world of the everyday behind and go head to head with the masters of the genre. Greetings, greetings followers. It is I, Cardinal Sin. And today on Masters of the Genre, I will be joined by my dedicated co-host PJ from Orville Nation. And we will also be joined by Tracy Torme. And I will give you his bio here in a sec. Now I'm just going to vamp for time for a little bit because of course it's not behaving and it's supposed to behave. Hmm. I hate windows. I hate windows. Let's try this again. Tonight, our guest on Masters of the Genre is Tracy Torme. He is the son of famous singer Mel Torme, and Tracy graduated from the USC School of Cinema Television in 1979. His two early mentors were Joseph Stefano, creator of the original Outer Limits, and Gene Roddenberry, creator of Star Trek. Torme began his career as a writer on SCTV and Saturday Night Live, during the show's 1982-83 season. In the late 1980s, Torme also wrote for Star Trek The Next Generation for the first two seasons. His first epi uh, season episode, The Big Goodbye, earned a Peabody Award. He later wrote and was associate producer on the 1988 film Spellbinder. Tracy Torme has written, consulted for, and produced many other TV shows and films, including Carnival, Odyssey 5, on which he also served as executive producer, and he wrote for the early 2000s remake of The Outer Limits. Torme is perhaps best known as co-creator and writer for the TV show Sliders. Torme also wrote the screenplay for the film about the Travis Walton abduction, Fire in the Sky, which was nominated for a Saturn Award for Best Writing in 1994. Torme also wrote the screenplay Intruders, based on the Bud Hopkins book of the same name, and produced UFO Cover-Up Live. Tracy served as an uncredited writer on the Jodie Foster movie Contact, based on the Carl Sagan movie of the same, or novel of the same name. Most recently, he wrote and co-created the 2020 UFO documentary, The Phenomenon, that was originally slated for wide theatrical nationwide release before the pandemic forced it to be released on video on demand, and it can now be seen on American uh, Amazon Prime Video, I can't talk today, with the trial subscription to Discovery Plus. Welcome, Tracy Torme, to Masters of the Genre. Oh, thank you, oh, Gil. Thank you, Gil. It's good to be with you guys. With you, guys. Uh, the, you know, it's somehow, very somehow good to have you. We missed, we missed I, am I Am Legend, because that's right, that's for, right for the genre. genre. I yeah, did miss yeah, I Am exactly. Legend. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. So, so. Hate to not hate talk, to not not talk, talk about, about that one. It was on here, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a question. I didn't put it in the... Yeah, 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 it, yeah, it, it should go away after a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure the, the, the reason that it does that. It has to do with my new microphone setup, but it should go away. Okay, okay. It's better now. It's better now. Is this better? Better. Better. Okay. 
So let's see. Uh, let's see who we who we have in the chat. Sliders fan blog. J W Sparrow. The stream elements bot is here, but not the stream elements tip jar. And we have, of course, Orville Nation, who is here uh, co-hosting. Intensified, Gap, Stargate. And because the uh, stream elements tip jar is not working, if you would like to buy me a coffee or send me a dollar, you may do so here. Hey, guys. Uh, we're, we're dog rescuers here. And our dogs and our are dogs kind of acting up, so I'm just going to have my wife remove them so they don't bark throughout this whole thing. Honey, you got them? You got them? Sorry, guys. That's great you guys do that. Wow. Yeah, we had seven rescue dogs until recently, and uh, we lost about three of them to old age, but we still got four. That's very cool. Real passion of ours. into the animal rescue thing yeah i totally. worked with PETA for a, a short time oh cool and yeah we they we uh, work with a lot of animal groups all over the world and uh i used to uh go down to the florida keys every summer and swim with dolphins which was really an amazing oh, wow. experience wow. isn't that cool the dolphin research center in the uh, in the florida keys a place called grassy key and we would go every summer and uh, spend, you know, 10 minutes at a time communicating with the dolphins and swimming with them. It was pretty amazing. Wow. It sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Uh, yeah. Tracy, you've written episodes of Carnival, Odyssey 5. The Outer Limits, Sliders, Star Trek, The Next Generation, and Saturday Night Live. You wrote screenplays for Fire in the Sky, Intruders, The Phenomenon, and UFO Cover Up Live. You were a producer on that, an executive producer on I Am Legend with Will Smith, and many of the shows and screenplays that you wrote. Without getting into Sliders, you already have a career of considerable note. How did you go from a writer to producer to executive producer. How did you oh, start out and how did things evolve as time went on? Sure, that's a pretty easy one to answer. Um, the first screenplay that I sold as a movie was originally called Witching Hour and it got made into a movie that was called Spellbinder, ultimately. And literally everything about the original script was just pulled apart pulled piece, apart, by, piece, piece by piece. Um, um, my main character my main in that movie, his name was Keith Mills. Keith Mills. And I was sitting on the set, on the set one day and I saw somebody call out to Jeff. And I thought, who's Jeff? And I went to the director and said, who's Jeff? Oh, that was Keith Mills, but I hate the name Keith. So his name is now Jeff. You would think that's not a big deal, but <laughs> piece by piece, I saw the entire film changed. And it was so upsetting to me that I vowed to become a producer to protect my own work. And that's really the main reason I became a producer was to keep someone else from screwing up my writing, to be honest with you. Um, and wh which so movie was that for? Sorry? Which movie was that for? Well, it was the movie that eventually was called Spellbinder. That oh, was right. another thing that went was the title. I thought Witching Hour was a really cool title. That got changed to Spellbinder. And hmm. uh, the way this all happened was the producer of the film told me one day, hey, I've got the perfect idea for the director for your movie. And I said, okay, great. Who's that? My wife. I said, oh, well, <laughs> does your wife direct? Well, she never has, but she wants to start on this one. So his wife ended up directing the movie. And all I can say is... Uh, was not pretty when it was finally done. Not pretty. <laughs> wow. Not pretty. Although yeah. Vanilla Ice loves the movie, he sent me a weird letter once about how it's like one of his favorite movies, and I Vanilla Ice like sent you a weird letter. Saying, yeah, I felt like writing back to him and saying, "Well, I wish you'd seen the original script," but it turned <laughs> out to be kind of a clunker of a movie. But since it was my first movie. And I was all excited to see it in a movie theater. 
I was so thrilled to go to the theater and see it. And then I saw it and I already knew that it wasn't going to be too good. And unfortunately it wasn't. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that's why I I became a producer. I I think that's an excellent decision. And uh, we've seen a lot of people (laughs) go that way. And uh, we, we, uh, uh, Colonel Sin and I are we we kind of know uh, we're, we're friends with. Uh, oh, did we lose him? No. Oh. Oh, you mean uh, Tracy? Tracy? Or just as PJ? Video. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Is the echo gone? Oh yeah, the echo's good. We just lost Tracy. So uh, Tracy yeah. and Robin live on. A mountaintop and their internet is not the greatest so uh he he looked great he's on his phone yeah. and he has the best internet on his phone rather than uh you know through whatever provider he's, re- he's a really nice guy huh he is super super sweet guy yeah and yeah. uh thank you so much for having me uh cardinal it's an honor oh, to be here. Yeah, you bet. And I've been looking forward to this interview for a long time. Yeah. This is uh Cardinal Sin has done a lot of work to bring this to you guys. And Tracy as well. And and I'm I'm glad that PJ is here because he will uh probably save my bacon at least more than once he has before. Um uh, tell us, uh, I did not catch your stream yesterday because um, it was crazy at home, but uh, how, is, uh, how is the uh, channel growing? It's, uh, I am, uh, I'm loving everything. Uh, Cardinal Sin and Friends, the panel show, went really well. And, Guys, can uh, you hear me? Yep. yep. You know, I was here the whole time. You just couldn't hear me. I was waving my arms. but Really? Your, uh, your image dropped out. Yeah, so. um, you guys can see me now, though, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. Sorry about that, fellas. No worries. Uh, worst things have happened. Okay. So, I, um, Tracy, if I can, I was just asking you that uh, we're uh, Car- Carl Sin and I are friends with uh, producer writer Joe Malazzi, and I was I forgot to ask Joe. We just got off the stream with him. If you guys had ever crossed paths? No, I've never. We've never met. Unfortunately, no. Sorry. To say. There's been a a, a hashtag in in our uh, chat uh joseph malazzi and T- uh tracy torme for star trek oh my god yes because we are unsatisfied with the star trek we are getting oh yeah uh that was quite a world when i first got involved with star trek i i really only was gonna do one just for fun because i thought it'd be fun to say that I did a Star Trek and I ended up writing six of them and I had no intention of doing that but Mr. Roddenberry really kind of took me under his wing and uh, I learned a lot from him and it ended up being a really fun experience in most ways. Uh, I was going to ask you is my next question. Tell us about your early mentors, Joseph Stefano, creator of The Outer Limits and Gene Roddenberry. Well, um, Mr. Roddenberry, uh, his uh, son, Rod Roddenberry, was actually friends with my little brother, James. Oh, wow. And that was just a coincidence. But I think when I met Gene, um, when he sort of realized that my brother was so close with his son, it kind of gave us a personal connection. And what started to happen, fellas, was that he would go for these rides in his golf cart from one end of the Paramount lot to the other. And he would come by my office and say, come on down, let's take a ride. And I'd go and get in the golf cart with him. And we would slowly make our way from one end of the studio to the other. And the entire time that we were together, he would tell me stories about the original Star Trek and he would sort of say to me, Tracy, one day you're going to have your own show. And I want to kind of tell you some of the stuff you're going to go through. And he would tell me these kind of sometimes horrific stories of his and, battles. And he was, with he was uh, right in, in the sense <laughs> of prophecy. Yeah. 
You That's did true. go on to have your own show. Yeah, and and, and I imagine those uh, pieces of advice were were really uh, important and helpful. Yeah, his influence was very strong, and um, I got to know him very well during my couple of years there, and uh, he was great. Um, as far as Joe Stefano, I mean, he's somewhat of a forgotten figure these days. I'm, I don't know how. Oh, we we know who are. he is. Yeah, and most of well, the people in our chat know who he is. Totally brilliant man, and uh, what had happened with Joe, he had gotten really fed up with all the Hollywood bullshit. Hope I can say that, that word. And, oh yeah, uh, you can say okay. any fucking thing you want on my channel. Oh, okay, good. So uh, Joe had basically just dropped out of television. You know, the Outer Limits, for instance. I mean, it was just hitting its peak after the first season. He got into a dispute with the network about the time slot for the second season. And as a matter of principle, he quit. And he walked off the show. He's not involved with the second season of The Outer Limits at all. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. And uh, he kind of just dropped out and uh, sort of became a bit of a hermit. And um, when I met him, he was just considering starting to work in the business again. And we were going to bring back The Outer Limits as a movie. And we actually were working on that before it came back as a series on Showtime. And uh, that was a very big favorite show of mine as a kid. I, I really think my biggest influences were The Outer Limits, The Twilight Zone, and The Prisoner. And then to a lesser yeah. degree, Star Trek. And... Uh, so I loved The Outer Limits, and, and I used to just enjoy so much getting to talk to him about his work on The Outer Limits, and uh, you guys might might or might not know, he wrote the screenplay for Psycho, and he also um, worked on a lot of Hitchcock's movies. Oh. Yeah. He, did he adapt that from Robert Block? Uh, he, that's a good question, and I don't want to answer it incorrectly. I was uh, I, I always thought that Robert on, Block was sure the who worked on it first, the author but, or the screenwriter. But Joe was an absolutely brilliant guy, and uh, can I tell you guys a quick story about him? That I think please, is yeah, please, yeah. Uh, I was just about Joe, to ask you to tell us your story about when you found yourself uh, with Joe Stefano uh, in front of a suit. <laughs> yeah, I can do a that. Studio with guy. I was thinking of that you guys might like. When Stefano, Stefano used to live on a street called Cielo Drive in Los Angeles. It's off of Benedict Canyon. And Stefano had had back surgery and he was recovering from it at home. And one morning he woke up and it was brutally hot. And he said to his wife, Marilyn, he said, God, it's hot today, Marilyn. It's the kind of day when people kill other people. And she looked at him and she said, Joe, that's the weirdest thing you've ever said to me. Where did that come from? That's <laughs> pretty weird. And he said, I don't, he said, I don't know. That night, right below his front porch was the Manson murders on Cielo Drive. Oh, wow. And it happened. Literally, you could hit a rock from that house, from his house. And that's what that street is still famous for. It's famous for being the Sharon, the Sharon Tate Street. And Joe just had this premonition that something weird was going to happen. And I'll never huh. forget him telling me that. Now that I brought everyone down. <laughs> no, that's, but. That's so weird. Isn't that weird? Pretty interesting, huh? That's yeah. It's fascinating. So I would like to say that he was, uh, he was really, really brilliant and really one of the best writers I've ever known. And he was just kind of damaged by the way he was treated in Hollywood, to be really honest. And he right. finally just kind of threw his hands up and walked away. Can't blame him. Yeah. I, I, I don't mean to, to, you know, to, to, to go off the rails here, but do you believe in stuff like precognition, Tracy? I do believe there's something else out there that we're occasionally tap into, not even fully understanding it ourselves. Um, my wife, for example, is very psychic in that way. She has 
premonitions and she can read people just by meeting them and tell them things about their brother or sister that she would have no way of knowing. So I've seen wow. that happen. So I, I didn't know, know that uh, Robin was uh, sensitive. Yes, I think she is. And definitely something to it, I think. Definitely. Interesting. Mm -hmm. wow. Thanks for sharing that. Oh, of course. Um, in an interview with the universe on the website Earth Prime, which I will uh, drop into the chat here, um, the largest site dedicated to sliders on the internet, you revealed that you were working on a feature called Storm Riders, a western set in the future. It was to be an American road warrior type of thing. What was your vision for Storm Riders and how did it progress versus the way you wanted it to? Well, guys, it's funny because I was just telling my wife recently, if I could do my career over again, the one thing that I would change, I got into a, a weird pattern where I would come up with an idea and I would sell the idea and the studio or the network would pay me for it and I would work on it and then for some reason when I was about done, things would change like the regime would change or political situations would change. And I would say, oh, well, I guess this one's not going to fly and go before the cameras. And I already had something else I wanted to do, so I would move on. If I could change all that and go back again, there were certain of my better projects or ones that have never gone before the camera. They were bought, they were paid for, but they were never produced. And Storm Riders would be near the top of the list. Um, and the mistake that I made, I was too nonchalant in a lot of ways about thinking, oh, well, that's just the way it works in Hollywood. And whatever happened, happened, and I'm going to move on now. And I did that a bunch of times with a bunch of different projects. And Storm Riders would be one. It was an HBO project. It was bought by the feature division of HBO and the series division. They planned to make it into a series, too. Hmm. And I wrote what I think is one of my better scripts. And I can't even remember the exact reasons why it was never made, but it wasn't made. And instead of fighting for it and trying to really make sure that it gets before the camera, I've always been a little bit too easygoing about being, you know, sort of nonchalant about it and thinking, oh, well, and moving on. If I could do that all over again, there are several projects that it's really my fault in the long run that I didn't totally go to bat for them. And Storm Riders is a classic example of that. Did I lose you guys? No, we're here. Okay, because your, your image just shrunk down, but oh, um, really? you, you can still see if me? If you could sit back a little bit, sure. uh, that... that would give us yeah we could see all of you there and i guess your dog better? in the foreground yeah that's perfect thank you <laughs> is that better guys? um so uh, i'm going to make myself big here so that i can uh make my point uh this is one of my favorite shows Odyssey 5 with Peter Weller oh. well yeah. And that leads me into a question, a question. Yeah. Uh, what was your experience being an executive producer on Odyssey 5 and writing a few episodes? Well, that was a show that everyone thought was really going to take off. When we were first uh, putting that first season together, uh, I think the, the predictions were that this was going to be a very big show. And, again, it's another one of those weird things. It's hard to explain why, but after only a sort of most of a season, it was canceled and never came back again. Do you guys know Manny Cotto? Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, not love, personally, love Manny but Cotto. follow his it career his yeah, with great interest. Oh, wow. It was his creation, and... Uh, we all thought yeah. it was going to be big, and I, I guess I wrote two or three of them. Um, unique concept, and for whatever reason, the vagaries of the business and why these things happen, it just somehow didn't find an audience, and they pulled the plug on it very quickly, 
in a lot of ways, that kind of happened to us on Carnival, too. That was only two seasons. And, yeah, I uh, was so disappointed when that show went off the air. Yeah, and it was Tracy, a really quality show. I agree. Sorry. How, yeah. how much? How much does it? How much does? Uh, how much do errors in initially marketing a project uh, have to do with uh, with that kind of failure? Um, I'm well, sorry, you're breaking up. Can you repeat oh. that? Can you hear? Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, how much? Uh, how that. much is? Uh, how much has uh, do, or how much do uh, mistakes in initially marketing um, the project have to do with 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 a project not moving forward? Do you think? Well, you know, I don't mean to be vague about this, but the reasons that things don't proceed, there are so many things involved in it. Um, a one, myriad of reasons. I, I created a series called True Tales of Terror. And the idea was sort of Twilight Zone like half hours. And at the very end of each story, you see the real story that it was based on. So you kind of throw that in for the last two or three minutes at the oh, end of the Oh, sort of, the of like um, One Step Beyond? Yeah, yeah, very much so. And uh, I sold that to the FX network. And I wrote two pilots for them. One was about the only woman that ever escaped from the Zodiac Killer. And uh, got to know a lot about the Zodiac Killer because of that one. But um, they were just certain that this was on a fast track and that it was really going to be a big hit for them. And then one day I got a call from the head of the network. Trace, you've got some bad news. What? You guys love the script, right? We do love the script. Well, what's the bad news? Well, we want to be more like HBO, so we've decided we're not going to do anthologies. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so that was the end of Food Tales of Terror. And then, like, as my usual way is, it's too bad. I moved on to the next thing I was working on. And right. it's just weird how those things happen. Um, and I wish the writer had more control over things like that. But there are so many things you have to sort of be beholden to to get your project to go all the way through. And uh, maybe one of these days I'll get ambitious and bring some of these things back on another network, but it sort of seems like too much work at the time, and, and I'm always eager to move on to something else. So that's my I, fault. I think that really you have a lot of fans that would be really into that idea. Yeah, and uh, Slider's fan blog says, sounds like that would have been a good show. And I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the Sliders fans have been tremendously loyal over all these years, especially given how the show basically jumped the shark. I was kind of amazed that the fans were willing to stick with it and they've been incredible right up right up to this day. And uh if you can lean back a little bit, we'll be able to see you right, better. Yeah. Absolutely. Um is it true that you invented the holodeck and the character Dixon Hill? Yes, that's all true. Can you tell um, us about uh, that? That was uh, sorry. Go ahead. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, uh, the the original Bible for Star Trek in their first season had some ideas that they were kicking around, but they hadn't really used yet, and I was especially fascinated by the vague idea of the holodeck. And so when I wrote my second Star Trek, you know, I've always been a tremendous uh, Raymond Chandler fan. And I love film noir in general. Oh, yeah, and me too. a chance to kind of Raymond Chandler's type story at the same time as using the holodeck. So I sort of killed two birds with one stone and... Uh, Really had fun on that episode, and we were lucky enough to win the Peabody, which was important for Star Trek at the time because it was it's really no small potatoes. at that point in its first yeah. season, you know? Yeah. I just have to interject something and, uh, here uh, that all uh, yeah. the, the holodeck, the fact that you made the holodeck possible uh, also means that uh, obviously we're a channel that's focused on the Orville, 
It also means you made the simulator on the Orville possible, I think, in some Correct. in some indirect oh, thank way. You. Thank you. Appreciate ha have that. Have you seen so, uh, the Orville, Tracy? Uh, you know what? I've got to admit that I have really not seen it, but I've also got to admit that I've heard good things about it. And uh, sort of for me, when I leave a show and I move on to another thing, I never go back and watch it again. I don't think I've seen a Saturday Night Live since I left that show. Nothing to wow. do with the show being bad. It just sort of feels like looking backwards, and it's sort of like I've probably got a psychological thing that yeah. I never do that. But uh, You definitely have a drive to move forward. More. Hopefully it keeps me, keeps me busy. Um, but I've heard good things about that show, and i got to be honest, I've heard some bad things about some of the other Star Trek you know, offshoots. Yeah, in the, the, past. the things that are actually Star Trek these days are worse than schlock. Isn't this? And the Sorry, Orville is the true Star Trek. Mm -hmm. They should just call okay, it Star cool. Trek the Orville. I'm going to have to start uh, checking it out. Hopefully, uh, the rumors that we've heard very recently are true. That Star Trek Discovery and Star Trek Picard are spinning down the toilet. Finally. Yeah, I almost wrote a uh, episode for the Picard show. And there's a whole long, boring story I won't tell you guys, but I was... You, you, you realize, Tracy, we are here to listen to your long, boring stories, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I was possibly going to bring Dixon Hill character back for the Picard show and there's a whole wow. number of reasons why we didn't go forward um, but you know that's definitely a show that when word got around that I was possibly going to do another Dixon Hill story on there I was contacted by a few different people warning me not to get involved with the Picard show and uh, begging you please I don't, know why, don't do it yeah yeah. They well, kind of they did, violate one of uh, Robert Meyer Burnett's uh, axioms. Never put your agenda or your uh, character before your story or your universe. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's his first law. That's the only advice. one that he has. Yeah, it's good advice. And uh, the ideologues that are uh, in charge of Star Trek now... I'm convinced haven't seen any Star Trek. They yeah, haven't written kind of any science fiction. They haven't that's, seen that's any. What I've been told, yeah. And uh, the only thing that they know about Star I'll Trek probably. is just enough to make fun of it. <laughs> and actually, well, Michael Michael Chabon, the, the Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, mm -hmm. uh, was in charge of Picard. And he actually was quoted in one of the trades variety or deadline or something like that as saying that they were writing Picard to quote, piss off the older fans, unquote. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. I, I do want to, I do want to say this and I, I do hope you don't get in trouble, Tracy, but uh, I, I was, I'm still holding out a little bit of hope that uh, uh, the, the new Picard showrunner, Terry Metalis, uh, um, hopefully he was, you know, he's been, he worked under Berman and hopefully he will, um, uh, I don't know if they, if they let him, hopefully they, he might do something, uh, the better quality in season two. I don't know. I'll tell you one funny thing, guys, the story that I was starting to work on would have involved a relationship between, uh, Picard and a black girl. And it was with with another sort of future version of the holodeck too because there was it was a dixon hill story and then jonathan frakes told me you know tracy uh patrick's 83 years old and i was like really is he that old he said yeah and this is going to come actually he plays weird, he like, plays 93 in the show oh okay he said you're going to have an 83 year old guy having a relationship with a 20 something year old girl it's yep. going to seem kind of weird, and I thought... Totally yeah, inappropriate for a Starship yeah. captain. Yeah. Exactly. Can I ask so you... So I never ended up doing it. But. Tracy, can I ask you a question about that? Because I always felt Star Trek got this wrong. 
But sure. before uh, you do, uh, PJ, yeah. I would just like to interject and ask Tracy to relax and and uh, just lean back. Okay. That it, way we can see all of him. Um, okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask because I always felt Star Trek got this wrong, and I'm actually in the process of making a video about it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, um, age you know uh, age medicine studies right now that think that even right now we can extend life uh, much longer than we have, and it feels right. to me like it feels to me like somebody in the Picard area who's 93 might actually feel like they're 50 or something or 60. Mm, yeah. uh, have you have any thoughts on that? That makes a lot of sense. Um, when I was first sort of working on a new Dixon Hill story, his age never even really crossed my mind. And then, uh, which is stupid on my part, but then uh, Frakes. Uh, <laughs> but I think you're right. Yeah. Frakes. The, this of, whole thing should have happened 20 years ago. Yeah. Frakes alerted me to it. And I, after that, I thought, oh, wow. I mean, I. I I was asleep at the wheel on that one. Um, but yeah, the stuff that got back to me about the Picard show was not positive to say the least. So yeah, I can't really say cause I've never seen it. Uh, I, I want to uh, mention that we can see your eyes, but we can only see about 10% of you because I think your, your dog is taking up most of the room I think it's or whatever cloth. that is in front of you. There's a cloth in front of the camera or something. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, there, there you, you go. go. Is that better, there guys? Yeah. Much better. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So I wanted to ask you, why did you part ways with Star Trek The Next Generation after two innovative and imaginative seasons? What was going on behind the scenes? Well, um, I had never intended to be there that long. Uh, after the Peabody show, uh, they made a nice offer to me for the next another season, so I stayed. But I told them I want to make this movie that eventually became Fire in the Sky. And I was starting it and I said, if you guys give me the freedom to work on that, you know, while I'm writing these new episodes, I'll stay for another year. So really it was the fact that I felt after two seasons and six episodes that I had pretty much said everything that I had to say on that show, um, learned so much from G. Gene by that point was pretty much gone. And I just felt like it was time to move on and, and make the movie that I was wanting to make. Um, and that was really the, the, the reason that I left. I sort of felt like I'd done my thing and, and it had been fun and successful and that was time to move on. And it's really all there was to it. Fair enough. You'll you'll spare us all the the juicy behind the scenes details. Well, um, I can tell you that I sort of got immersed in the world of Star Trek, where you know the fanaticism of the fans, and I say that in a good way, not a bad way, was kind of awe inspiring. Um, their devotion to the show. Some people looked at that a little bit askew, like they were kind of nutty by loving the show that much. But if you're writing on a show like that and they take it this seriously, you can't really ask for anything better than that. Um, I remember I spoke at a Star Trek convention somewhere near the end of the first season. And there was a little kid, I shouldn't say a little kid, he was probably 15 or 16, uh, but a small guy. A youngster. He follow yeah. He was following me around the convention, and I would, I would look over my shoulder, and I would see him kind of staring at me, and it started to g give me the creeps. I was kind of wondering what's going on with this guy. Finally, hmm. he marches up to me, and he says something like, in episode such and such, you have the Enterprise going at, Seven point warp seven point five. When it's been proven that if the Ever Enterprise goes above seven point three, it will implode. How do you explain this? He was angry. <laughs> he, was, he was really on the next generation. Oh yeah, and I was like, he, oh man, he didn't know his Star Trek. 
this guy needs a chill pill or something. So mm -hmm. I, I found out that way that it was uh, very, fans were very passionate about it, which kind of prepared me a little bit for what happened with sliders because sliders became, I think one of the first big, you know, internet shows. I mean, people were talking about it on the internet in a mm -hmm. time when basically no one was using the internet. It was one of the, I think the first shows to do that. And the experience with the Star Trek fans had sort of prepped me for what some sliders fans would morph into, which again, I was, uh, totally thankful that people were able to see through all of the turmoil surrounding sliders and not get uh, scared off by it. Um, and that's continued to amaze me all these years later. I still hear from sliders fans quite often and it's pretty amazing. I'm, I'm really grateful for it. And, and again, if you could uh, lean back just lean back. slightly, Sorry, you'd guys. be able to see much I'll try more. I to remember that. Uh, I looked forward to watching Sliders every week. It was such a different creative it's idea so for a science fiction show. I understand that it nearly didn't get made, that it had a rocky start, and you had to fight for it for it to continue for the first few seasons. What can you tell us about that? Well, the, the easiest way to answer that, guys, is when I was writing the Sliders pilot movie, which was a two-hour movie, I said to them, guys, you know what I'm struggling with is Sliders could be a really cool science fiction adventure show, but it also could be a really good black comedy sort of satirical show. And every time I think I want to do it one way, the other way starts to tug at me and I'm not sure what to do. And Bob Weiss, uh, who had done the Naked Gun movies and the Blues Brothers and stuff like that. Those are awesome. Was, I love those movies. Uh, working on sliders with me. He said to me, well, why don't you do both? And I said, oh, man, you know what? That's going to drive the network crazy. You think I shouldn't even try? And guess what? So That's exactly what the Orville did. If you look at did. the original pilot movie, um, it is a straightforward science fiction story. And then they find themselves in Soviet America, where the Soviets mm -hmm. have taken over the U.S., and we went very satirical with that. I mean, there's a scene in the People's Court on it. And we, we just threw in a lot of sort of iconic uh, humor scenes. And I, I remember a did. particularly humorous episode where they slide in to an alternate Earth. And there are some hippies nearby. And <laughs> one of them asks, "Yeah, Who, who's the president? And the guy goes, <laughs> Oliver North, man. Yeah, yeah, that was <laughs> uh, that. called the Summer of Love. Yeah, um, that was great show. Yeah, but uh, we did try to straddle both of those worlds with sliders. Uh, we kind of bounced back and forth. We were always trying, trying to put some sort of hopefully sophisticated comedy into these action science fiction stories. And that was a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed that. But at the same time, it drove the network crazy. I mean, it started. They didn't a have a box to fit it into. In the first season. What's that? They didn't have a box Sorry, to put you. it into. They didn't know they where did it went. They did not have a box, and they saw that as a great weakness. So, yeah. what that basically ended up being every week. I had to fight with the network and the studio to try to do the stories that I wanted to do. And um, sometimes I succeeded, sometimes I failed, and it was really never easy. And after two and a half years of swimming upstream where we were having success with sliders, but the network was never really behind us. Um, there were other shows that kept coming on that they were supporting. Do you guys remember a show called uh, VR5 or something like VR5, that? VR5, uh, you bet. It was yeah. another Fox show. David McCollum. Same time we did. And we used to always complain that they were supporting that show really heavily, but they weren't really supporting us. So 
to make a long story short, it was always a struggle to keep sliders going. And after two and a half years, um, there was a producer named David Peckinpah who had been the producer on a show called Silk Stockings. And he was handpicked by the network to come in and partner with me as me with, as his showrunner on the show. And he told me right away that the main thing he had been told by the network was that the show was too cerebral and they needed to do something <laughs> about that. Just like Star so Trek. He went to, yeah, well, he went to work trying to make sure that we would not be too cerebral from that point on. And for the next two and a half years, I found it really hard to watch the show because I, I, I felt like it, the quality of everything on the show went way downhill. And I was amazed that some people stuck with it. And I felt horrible for the fans because all the continuity we had started to get was sort of tossed out the window and i recently read in a book that it said the the number one example of a show jumping the shark was sliders and i thought yeah that makes sense so uh what what specifically was, was it that made you decide to leave sliders um well in the third season my dad had had a stroke and he was uh, really struggling with it and slowly dying, to be honest with you. And I wrote a story, it's still my favorite sliders that I ever wrote. It was called The Guardian. And, and, and this is the one where you tried to incorporate your father, Mel, into sliders? No, that was another one. My dad did, did appear on the sliders, but no. Oh. This was one oh. where Quinn is uh, dealing with the death of his father. And I... Uh, tapped into what was going on in my real life at the time mm -hmm. and I wrote The Guardian and it was my favorite script that I ever wrote for Sliders and when it finished I ran it for David Peckinpah, I ran the early uh, cut of it and I was really proud of it and as soon as it finished Peckinpah turned to me and said well, that's exactly the kind of show we're not going to be doing anymore Right. And at that very moment I decided that's it, I'm gone so my contract was up, mm -hmm. and I moved over to Warner Brothers, where I got had a deal there, and I left Sliders, and I, I'm still on the credits as executive consultant the sure. last few seasons, but it really I had nothing to do with it the last few years. So, yeah. In in 2004, you were involved in the making of Sliders for Universal Home Video. What was that like, and what are fan and fan club interactions like? Um, don't remember too much about working on that. Um, I'm sure it was just some very rudimentary stuff. Um, what, what was your second question, Gil? Uh, what are fan and fan club interactions like when you run into fans uh, conventions when you're signing stuff or on the street what have yeah. you what, what what's that like for you well I'm very appreciative of the devotion to the show and when they ask me questions that show that they really get the show that they know what we were trying to do that those things really touch me and I don't mean that in a in a maudlin way I'm, I'm really serious it, to me uh, all that work that's been put in, into something. And then when the fans have a real passion for something, it's fantastic. It's hard to even describe. It makes everything worthwhile, to be mm -hmm. really honest with you. And uh, I've noticed, you know, online, every now and then I've checked in with different groups and just sort of seen what they're talking about. And um, if sliders had been promoted the way it should have been say by fox and by universal um it it you know he, john reese davies used to always say to me that he thought this was going to be the next star trek i don't know mm -hmm. that it ever would have been the next star trek but um the only thing that really held it down or held it back 
was that we had a network and a studio that never really fully understood what we were trying to do or what we were trying to say with the show. Um, so, you know, uh, again, David Peckinpah is long dead and I don't wish ill on anyone who's dead, but if anyone saw sliders in the third or fourth season, it just became the movie of the week in the sense I, that they I watched would take all the episodes and all plot. the seasons. Yeah. They would take every movie plot that was popular. If they were doing a movie about a giant anaconda, then we would do the sliders <laughs> about a giant anaconda. I, I were understand were that, no, uh, Mark Scott yeah. Zakri became the showrunner after a while. Yeah. Yeah. No, he wasn't a showrunner. He was just a writer. But oh, he okay. was a talented guy. I loved his Twilight Zone book. But oh uh, yeah, the Twilight Zone. No, he was never was a showrunner. Yeah. What do you so think, uh, Tracy? Um, what do you think about what he's doing with uh, raising his own uh, money for Space Command? I haven't heard that much about that. More, more, want to tell me a little bit more about that? Well, he's basically he's he's been basically uh, fundraising to do his selling own, shares. Uh, yeah. Uh, selling shares and, and and just plain fundraising as well to just do uh, produce his own uh, his own sci-fi and and run it himself. It's funny because and he and his wife have also written a book about greenlighting yourself, and it's it's all about his success stories of what to avoid and how to how to write yourself you know in so that you get your show made by yourself. Well, it's weird. Uh, after I wrote The Big Goodbye, he wrote me a very nice letter. I'd never met him. He liked that episode a lot, and he wrote me a long letter. And then it just was a coincidence that years later, when I left Sliders, he joined Sliders. And knowing that mm -hmm. he was now on the staff, I uh, contacted him and said, Mark, do something different because the show is really going off the, the rails. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure he was trying really hard himself, but uh, I don't believe he was in a position of power on the show. Yeah, he has probably. expressed some frust, like to us. We've inter we both interviewed him, and he's expressed some frustration as well. So. Yeah. I, I interviewed him for Masters of the Genre, and then PJ mm -hmm. stole him for a weekly show. <laughs> you bastard. Yeah, he was a nice guy. and I, I do remember his wife really well, too. Elaine, um, yeah, she's great. Yeah, and his Twilight Zone book is great. I mean, it's I, it's you know, indispensable. Yeah, there's a third edition out now. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it's got links to stuff that you can find online, and he's also oh. uh, he just released on his Mister Sci-Fi YouTube channel a uh, a thing about um, the commentaries that he that he did for the Blu-ray set, but mm. apparently he didn't do the fifth season or something mm. like that. So you can go to the uh, twilight zone commentaries.com and it mm. gives you the whole, the whole uh, idea behind it, but he's going to do like another 113 or 115 commentaries. Really? Yeah. I'd like yeah. to do that. I really would. And uh, yeah. actually, he also, Tracy, uh, somebody had donated, or Rod, at one point, Rod Serling donated a, like a, a, a thousand recordings or something that he had to a university. And some, somehow that's ended up in Mark's hands. And he it, it, the, it was actually in uh, Carol Serling's attic. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. So they're going to they're gonna do something with that. I don't know exactly what. Yeah, no, he's... That's uh, what I'm saying. Actually, I should, he's, he's I going should try to, be, to get back in touch with him. He's going to be writing stories uh, that are based on these thousands of hours of uh, uh, Rod Serling recordings that have never been heard before. Oh, that's fantastic. That's very interesting. And uh, he's going to make, uh, I think, radio plays out of them. And, uh, it, are yeah, you guys it's, in it's, touch with him? Yes, we both have interviewed him, yeah. We can connect I mean, you. Are you in touch with him, like personally? Yeah. Away from we can definitely hook you up. The interviews. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to say hi to him. I haven't talked to him in many years. Thanks, I appreciate that. It's did you Did because, you watch uh, the beginning of the of the show, the intro? 
what to the Twilight Zone? No, to Masters of the Genre. Oh, did I watch it? No, I guess yeah. Not. Um, I'll Have I'll you, uh, you send it. You send it to me. I'll, I'll put it I'll on it. again. It's, 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 just for okay, people okay. that missed it, um, because Mark Scott Zakri is in it. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So it's give interesting. Me a thing, uh, when my when wife, my wife and, I and I first got together, we had to get together for years now. now. One of the one first of the things, things we, did, we did, I found, I found out that she really never seen never the Twilight, Twilight Zone. Oh, but we wow. made a point, made a point of, of watching, watching all, the all the episodes over the years. years. And of, and course, of course, for me, I, I knew them knew all, them like all back and back and hand. Of but course, it was fun, so it was fun turning on to them. them. And she's, and she's become, become a really, a really big, big fan now. now. So, oh, so we, uh, we, uh, we went through we the, the whole list. Because <laughs> Richard, okay, Richard, here's, here's the my, here's my the opening writer, writer that I think maybe nobody caught because I I didn't have the settings on correctly. So we will uh, play the opening. It's only a minute long. You're tuned into Masters of the Genre, where I, Cardinal Sin, take you right to the source of the most important genre creators of their generation. Authors, actors, directors, science fiction, fantasy, comics, film, and other creators. And that's the only part that Mark Scott decrees in, so you oh, get the great, idea. That's great, guys. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Very cool. Tracy, I have to I have to address the elephant in the room. What was it like growing up with, with your dad <laughs> at being who he was? The velvet well, fog. It was great. Um, you know, the one thing that it influenced me on, believe it or not, was not to get into music because <laughs> uh, the kind of music that I would have done because I was already fiddling with it at a young mm -hmm. age. I was like really like a Beatles guy, you know, I was like Beatles, oh, wow. Bob Dylan, Neil Young, that kind of stuff. And yeah. I just was not a jazz guy. Now, both of my brothers are jazz singers. And I knew that if I went into music, the kind of music that I would have done would not have been very respected in my family's house, you know. Mm -hmm. So I decided very early on that was not a good way to go. So... It moved me into another direction, but uh, he was an amazing guy. Um, I think as time goes on, he's going to be appreciated more and more because unlike most of his contemporaries, other singers, the uh, Sinatra, Tony Bennett, those type of guys, mm -hmm. my dad was like a really amazing musician. He wasn't really just a singer. He was originally a drummer. And he was a really great I songwriter. I didn't know that. He played great piano and guitar. He wrote the Christmas song. And uh, he uh, he really was, I mean, I've so often met other musicians who, who really appreciate my dad. And in, in a lot of ways, I think he was underrated. But I think as time goes on, his legacy will endure. And it's going to be... Uh, really uh helpful in have, making sure people remember him because now he's been dead since 99 so hmm. he's been gone believe it or not almost he, see, he seemed like just a beautiful person thank you he was a really good man he really was thank you it, it must have been a really awesome childhood growing up hmm. as his son it was fun man uh he sounds like he was a lot home. of fun Miles Davis hanging out in the uh, living room and uh, wow there's a lot of people like that I mean I remember um, when I met Charlton Heston because he was a good friend of my dad's and uh, my dad telling Charlton Heston that I was a big fan of the Omega Man the truth is I really wasn't but it ended <laughs> up being my legend so years later we did it um, but uh, there are always people like that coming in and out of our lives and uh Pretty unique, pretty unique way of growing up, to be honest with you. Wow. 
I bet. What what was your what would you say is your favorite sci-fi growing up, Tracy? My favorite uh, book. Your favorite. Or... Your well, uh, either book or other. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I think I said this before, but I don't know if you guys heard me. Richard Matheson is my favorite writer. So anything yeah. he ever did, you know, I'm reading a short story collection of his right now as we speak. Um, so uh, that was a big. He was a big influence. It's on me. Um, as far as movies go, like I love both of the first two Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Those are two of my favorites. I like the original yeah. Thing. Um, the I Thing like, from Another uh, World. Yeah, yeah. Where James like Arness a plays a, a huge carrot. Huge carrot, exactly. <laughs> um, I worked on a remake of that at the Sci Fi Channel, another one that was never made. Um, mm. But uh, um, those are two favorites of mine. I love a British film. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it called The Day the Earth Caught Fire. Have you ever seen that Actually, film? Actually, um, oh. I just uh, ordered that and watched that about three weeks ago. What did you think? Um, compared to <laughs> all of Jerry Anderson's other stuff, I, I thought it was better. Uh, I, I like his stuff when he uses, you know, flesh and blood actors instead of the marionation thing, which is interesting. No, I, but... I don't believe he was rec He was involved with that film. Oh, I'm sorry. That was so, a uh, journey to the far side of the sun. Um, yeah, I, I bought them in, in the same batch. I bought them together. Um, uh, I, really it, it, I, I thought it resounded right. a lot with today's, uh, climate change. If you, uh, get stuff chance to see, uh, Day the Earth Caught Fire, it's very timely nowadays, too, because of the climate change stuff. And it's a really, really interesting film. That's like an obscure one that I really yeah. like. Um, I basically like like what I would call realistic science fiction. I'm not like a big, huge Star Wars guy. Um, mm -hmm. I like stuff that has more of a real edge. I like, like Soylent Green and its day and... Uh, Things like that. Um, you like science fiction as opposed uh, to sci-fi. I think that's a safe bet. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, um, I just, for me, for me personally, I, w I know this sounds pretentious, but I kind of just like quality. I mean, if I see that the actors are really nailing it, the writing is really smart, the editing is really smart, if that's like really that, pretentious, then I'm a really pretentious to. writer, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I don't know if that answers the question, but those are some yeah. that come to mind. Thank you. Um, you know, I uh, guess... Uh, go ahead. Tracy, fans are very excited about the prospect that you are bringing back Sliders and it's not only a continuation, but that you're bringing back the original cast. Can you confirm or deny that? And if it's true, what sort of battles did you have to go through to make it happen? And how is creating a show in the early 21st century different from creating one in the late 20th century? Okay. Um, well, I can't say that the original cast is all coming back. Because we haven't made those deals yet, but I talk mm -hmm. to Clevant Derricks all the time, and uh, I imagine that there wouldn't be a sliders without Jerry O'Connell, and I talked to Reese Davies, so eventually I believe it's going to be a mixture of the old original cast and a couple of new characters. Um, we're right in the middle of rebooting it right now as we speak. If mm -hmm. you had talked to me about this six months ago, I would have said, oh, yeah, that's a rumor. Because there have been a lot of rumors over the years, but they were never real. Right. But this one is real. We were actively working on it. Um, as far as to answer your question about what it's like in this day and age, the first thing that I noticed is how we are all so hypersensitive about the politics now mm -hmm. that I thought I had a tough time. 20 years ago or whenever it was 
30 years ago. Getting mm-hmm. certain stories off the ground with sliders, and it's much worse now. So I can tell you uh, it's going to be more of a struggle even than it was then because already I've thrown a couple of ideas out and everyone in the room was kind of horrified. Oh, you can't do that. So I can already tell you people are so hypersensitive to so many issues now that it's going to be even more of a challenge trying not to turn it into some politically correct safe show if it becomes that what's the point of doing it so yeah that's going to be the big struggle you know actually um, and um, i can already feel be, it. because i have uh been uh, trying to put together this interview for a few weeks uh uh somebody left a comment that said oh no that's going to be woke as shit and i said <laughs> no not if tracy okay. torme the original creator is behind it He's not going to let it be woke. Thank you. Yeah, so, I promise you it will never be woke. Yeah. Never. <laughs> there will never be the, a girl really that's the the key to everything that can do, you know, like she's a Mary Sue or whatever. Yeah, I mean, there is already pressure along those lines of doing things that would be considered uh, topical um, and safe in a way. And I'm always going to struggle to try not to fall into those traps. And, uh, you know, one of the other things that Peckinpah told me was that the network considered me difficult, quote unquote. And in some ways, I wear that as a honor. If they think you're difficult, you're probably doing something right. Yeah. So I will always try with sliders because it's too close to my heart, really, to uh, have it not, you know, go on the safe and narrow path that uh, most shows are pigeonholed into, if you know what I mean. Well, the the pressures that you were referring to, to, uh, to make it, uh, you know, politically uh, popular these days, where, where do those pressures come from? Well, it's not as simple as being like the network and the studio like it was in the old days. You know, so many of these entities have morphed into something else. Um, We were talking to the Peacock Network, which I found out in some weird way. He will return. Uh, and, um, Gil, do you think there's any way we could get him to, uh, maybe slant up his phone or something? Cause we were getting, a- I, I, uh, I asked him, uh, earlier, um, if he could just like sit at his computer and put it on his, on his, uh, his phone on his keyboard and just set it like that. But you know, he, he's, uh, he's gonna do it the way he wants to do it. So I keep reminding him to, uh, you know, because I, uh, I think before we started, we had a better image of him. Like before we, we did when we were backstage, right? But uh, you know, you take what you get, right? There's um, only so many times I can tell him to uh, yeah. to lean back so we can see him. But, um, uh, but listen, yeah, uh, even earlier uh, today than that, we had a uh, a tech dress rehearsal. And uh, it was perfect. It you know sounded great, looked great. But uh, I told him you know you need to put it somewhere where it won't move around. And uh, evidently he did that, but he's just not. <laughs> he hasn't got the dog out of the way. Um, fascinating interview. Uh, and very nice guy. Very nice. Yeah. Guy. So far so good. And and thank you for uh, for co-hosting again. It's. Uh, it's always great to have you on, and and uh, it's always a pleasure, man. I feel a, a little guilty that we're not alternating channels, you know. And uh, I, I know that not. you have enough on your plate already on your channel. Um, yeah, you know, we'll uh, we'll see where things go, and 
Um, life has been, you know, po d post during and post COVID, life has been difficult for both of us. So yeah. uh, we'll fi we'll figure things out. Um, I, I'm probably going to be moving into the fringe, the paranormal show, from Thursdays to some other day of the week. Okay. Uh, and so if if it's easier for you, I might move Masters of the Genre to a different day as well. Although I've heard that Mondays are good for streaming because uh, nobody streams on Mondays. Mondays are good, yeah. Um, but I, I, but you yeah. obviously stream on Mondays. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I like we, you and I didn't conflict today. But. No. Can yeah. you hear me, guys? Yep, we can. Okay. Uh, can't see you, but we can hear you. Can't see me at all, huh? Nope. Let's try it again, Robin. Honey, I don't know. You um, Any better? You sound great. Well. Uh, but you're just a big white circle. Um. And it's not good for internet or telephone. Well, it's, it's not. It's not app. great for video uh, let's on keep trying. on YouTube. There, you, there go. you go. Can you see me now? Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's perfect. Hello. Much better. Now there's yeah. no sound. <laughs> they can see you. Now we think you can see us, but we can't hear. We you. can. We can hear you. We can hear you, and we can see you very well. Microphone. Yeah. Can you hear us? Maybe the... I don't know. Hi, Robin, again. Can you hear us? Oh, it's a phone. Oh, they can see me. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? I don't think they can hear us. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. I don't know why the mic won't work. Now we're just getting an image of the window and the wall. Yeah, there you go. Leave that up. I think I will. I don't know. And uh, everybody that's uh, with us. You're on uh, there. They can see we you. We appreciate your patience. But Perfect. Can you hear us? Cam, mic, settings, audio. I think Echo she's got it. Cancel. Automatically adjust mic volume. Everything's there on the settings that's supposed to be there. I don't understand this. We can hear you and we can see you. I don't know. Mike, Cam. Cam we here. can hear you and we can see you. Working. Let's see, maybe. It's all the way up. We're good. Everyone can see and hear you. Yep, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Everyone they can can't hear me. us, though, right? Guys, you can see me, but you can't hear me. Is that right? No, no we can, we hear can you. see and yes. hear you. I think he's saying yes. Okay, I, I don't know how to fix this. The microphone uh, is saying that it's working. May, it might be better to leave and come back. We're in. muted for some reason that we don't understand. Um, okay. I don't know what to do. hear you guys at all. Try leaving the studio yeah, and coming back in. Yeah. Thing. We're going to keep trying, in. guys. Hang in there with us. Come back in. Just going to start over. Yes. There you go. There, they got it. A stream yard isn't the most intuitive thing, but it's generally pretty, uh, 
pretty functional. Yeah, they, they might not be used to using it on their phone. So. Well, and also uh, the the phone is is the most uh, powerful internet device they have in the house, but they live on top of a mountain because they got disgusted with uh, L.A. Mm. So their internet isn't the greatest. You? Can yeah, you hear us? So. Yeah, now we can hear you finally. Okay, okay. groovy. I'll turn you up. We're back in business. Well. That's perfect. Yeah, there we go. Sorry about that. Right on. No. Uh, is that uh, an Eagles? Is that an Eagles shirt? Yeah, sure. Is. Are you What's talking it? about sports ball? <laughs> I I hate sports <laughs> ball. Um, so again, Tracy, back to our questions here. Um, mm -hmm. you worked on the 1996 Jacques Vallée novel Fast Walkers. Is it mm -hmm. another an, uh, unaccredited uh, writing job, or how did that happen? No, it was a novel that I wrote with Jacques Vallée, um, and uh, that's not uncredited; it's credited. Um, that was an interesting experience, but that sort of delves into the UFO world, which I've been straddling. <laughs> for many many years so uh it's a pretty cool time right now to have been involved with ufos because it's all finally coming to the light of day what many of us thought would never happen yeah That's maybe true. during our lifetimes they'll totally yeah. drop the bullshit yeah i mean it's going in that direction um the government is admitting to things we never thought they would finally and uh well they're admitting to the fact that the objects are real and then they they hedge you know we, yeah, we don't have any evidence to say that they are et but we don't have any evidence to say they're not but you know what i know that sounds uh, weak but that's actually the truth they uh they know it's real they don't know who's flying these things but I, I'm pretty sure they know it's not China and it's not Russia. They definitely do. That that's one of the first things they had to eliminate, and they know it wasn't China. It's not Russia. It's not American either. Um, but as to where it's from and why it's here and what it wants, they truly do not know. I know that sounds crazy. Do Do you think that um, those of us in the UFO community who are on your level, researchers and not just armchair researchers, do you think that maybe it's possible that we know more than they do? Um, I think there are certain people in certain corners of the government that have, have some pretty great proof on their hand like some amazing photographs maybe some some really good video that we're not privy to like um uh edgar mitchell no the other one gordon cooper related the some uh amazing the film pieces of video maybe even some piece of wreckage but mm -hmm. even though the They've got that, that. They don't know what. So he's freezing up a little bit. The, yeah. Um, real, real source of all this is. That's something that can, UFO. Can you repeat that? We lost your audio. Have had a really hard time getting their arms around for a long time because yeah. it's been thought all it's been uh, compartment compartmentalized clearance so literally one hand doesn't know what the other is doing all the way back to the 40s learn now is is basically proving that to be true um 
They don't know. It's a total mystery and still in a lot of ways. Oh, not again. Government. I mean a small, small portion of the government. Right. Those in the know. And after all these years, they still don't have the ultimate answers, which is incredible to some people. They just can't get their arms around that. But I've Well, I mean, it. if you think about the yeah. fact that the uh, the unclassified report that they put online was nine pages, and the classified report that they gave to Congress was ninety three pages. Uh, I don't think we're getting the whole the whole deal. I think in between the two, there's probably a big difference. Also, I, I don't like the way that they approached it with ATIP as a, a threat, and they keep referring to it as a threat because it's uh, violating restricted airspace and that kind of thing. It's been doing that since the 50s. Um, I, uh, I think they're not shooting them down or trying to shoot them down anymore. So, you Guys, can you hear me? Honey, stop. Can't can stop hear ready. you, They're yes. Ready, we can oh, hear you. Can. Okay. I want to close this window. What were you saying about shooting something down? That uh, I, I dislike their approach by calling it a threat uh, because it's, mm. you know, they're, they're flying through restricted airspace. Um, uh, you know, back when they thought that these things were a threat and they tried to shoot them down, uh, people like uh, uh, Captain Thomas Mantell, uh, it didn't work mm -hmm. out so well for those people. <laughs> well, you know yourself so, if you know who Mantell was. Oh, yeah. Um, that's a name that's been forgotten, really, to be honest with you. Um, I, I hope not in the, the UFO thing, community. Well, the thing to think about, though, Gil, is... The only reason that we're getting any of this information that's come out in the last few years is because they're buying into the idea that it is a threat or a potential threat. And some people who otherwise would not have been moved by the mystery of the situation, they are moved by the idea that this could be a threat. Believe it or but not. It, if it were really a threat, Tracy we would have been wiped out a long time ago. I pretty much agree with you. I, it's not really a threat unless we go up and try and threaten them. I'm not saying it should be a threat, but what I'm saying is the fact that some people in the government bought into the idea that it could be a threat, that's the only reason this stuff is coming out now. Yeah, you're probably right about that. Yeah, yeah. Tracy, what um, what was did you actually if I if I may ask a quick, quick question? Yeah. Did you actually have a uh, relationship with Travis Walton? Oh yeah, very good one. To this day, pretty good friends. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. Good, really good guy. Very smart guy. And uh, known him for uh, I think I met him in uh, when was it seventy five maybe. Wow. Yeah, and I've known him ever since. Uh, wow. when, did, when did the uh, event take place? Uh, you know what? I'm getting... I thought it was around 75. I'm getting my dates mixed up. I first met him 10 years after the event. So 85. I met him in, eight, I met him in 85. Uh -huh. and the event okay. happened in 75. Um, yeah. He'd be a good guy for you guys to interview. You Actually, he's, he's on my list. Yeah, if you ever want me to set that up, I can do that. Please, please do. Yeah, that'd be. He's a great interview. He's a. Uh, Christopher O'Brien gave me his information, but I promptly lost it. Oh, Chris <laughs> O'Brien. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. He was on uh, uh, Into the Fringe last week for oh, the cool. second uh, hour, and the first hour was Walter Bosley. Oh, cool! Very cool. Who is a a great guy, also. Did Chris talk um, about the uh, mysterious valley and all that stuff? Yeah, we yeah. do. Good stuff. But, you know more uh, about that than anybody. Uh, 
on into the fringe, on masters of the genre, or, or we try to stay into the realm of uh, genre fiction. Right. I, I think that's smart. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what do most of the fans of your work and casual viewers alike not know about Tracy Torme? Oh, man. Well, um, people in this genre don't really know a lot about things that are outside of this genre. Um, I played a lot of baseball and football in my younger days. Sports was really important to me. Uh, very passionate about dogs and about animals. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I sort of feel like I'm living in a science fiction novel these days just by being alive. I'm seeing changes, <laughs> yeah. changes going on all around me. Sometimes think about my dad and think, oh, my, get, my dad must be turning over in his grave right now because the world is going a bit crazy. And I remember all of my life, you're always hearing people say, oh, the world's coming to an end. Oh, the world is so screwed up. Oh, this and that. And I used to always think that was just such nonsense. But now I got to tell you, some of the patterns that we are living with I think are really destructive and I'm not just talking about obvious things like global warming or whatever, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about some of the uh, militant attitudes that people have against other people. And, you know, I almost feel like we're heading toward a second civil war, to be really honest with you. Um, yeah, this, this country is definitely uh, more divided than it's been in 40 years. Definitely, definitely. Uh, probably more divided um, than it's been since before the Kennedy assassination. So, 60 yeah, years. I think that's absolutely true. Yep, I think that's true. Um, you know, I, I guess... Uh, I guess I would consider myself uh, patriotic, although that's like a dangerous word to use because you'll get labeled. But I do appreciate the United States and I... Uh, worry about the direction that it's headed in and uh, um, what else can I say? I'm sure most people don't necessarily know that about me, but um, I worry a lot about the direction we're heading in. Um, you and me so, both. Yeah. Yeah. And, and speaking of uh, uh, kind of negative politics, The Prisoner is one of my favorite shows and is often cited as the best television series ever made. I understand you're somewhat of an authority on the 1967 TV show. What can you tell us about it? Well, I can first of all tell you that when I heard there was a remake of it being made, I was so excited, and it ended up, in my opinion, being unwatchable. It's like everything yep. that made the original good was gone. I don't know what they yep. did with that. But... Uh, I remember I first saw this series in the 60s. I think I was in Miami Beach with my family. For, my dad was working down there. And this series came on, and we were just kind of astonished by it. It was so different than all the TV of its day. And I became a, you know, a very uh, committed fan to it from that day forward. Um, and... Uh, When I, was, when I had an office at Universal Studios, the lady who was working as my assistant came up to me one day and said, aren't you like a big fan of Patrick McGowan? I said, oh, yeah. He said, well, you know, I used to work with him because I worked on Columbo, and he did a couple of guest stars on that. Would you like to meet him? And I said, are you kidding? So one day he came into my office And uh, I, I'm not usually intimidated by too much, but I was pretty intimidated meeting him because I felt... And, and he came in your office? Yeah, he did. And I, I thought he, he was on the phone. No, no, no. He, was, he, was, he stopped in and he was only... It was actually a two-part thing. At first I saw him in my office and then he went and left and said, we'll continue this later. And we continued it on the phone. So oh, I see. Time, yeah, most of the time I talked to him, it was on the phone. 
but uh, I got to ask him pretty much everything I've always wanted to ask about the prisoner. And, you know, I've been warned about him that he was a really hard drinker and that he certainly cantankerous. didn't suffer. Yeah, cantankerous, didn't suffer fools quite me. So I was, you know, I was concerned about coming off in a good light with him. But he ended mm-hmm. up being really, really kind and patient with me. I think once he saw that I really knew the series, that I had watched it carefully, he really opened up much more than he would have otherwise. And uh, he was just an amazing guy. I will never forget that experience. And since this show is Masters of the Genre, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Another guy that I met that I was equally impressed with was Jonathan Harris. You know, of course, who that is, right? Of course, yeah. That's uh, brilliant. Well, we ended up speaking at a convention somewhere together, and we were both backstage for like three or four hours waiting to go on or whatever it was. And so he and I talked for three or four hours, and wow. he was one of the coolest. He was one of the coolest guys I've ever met in my life. He was absolutely brilliant. He was a Jeopardy freak. He never missed Jeopardy, no matter where he was. We actually That's had to cool. stop the one Jeopardy, and uh, the guy had a mind like a steel trap, mm-hmm. and uh, told me a lot of great lost in the space stories, which. Um, you know, I always used to be amused by that show and had fun with it. Never took it that seriously, but he told me about an episode and he said, Tracy, if you've never seen this episode, you've got to see it. And it was one where Mm -hmm. they're battling these giant vegetables. Yeah, the Vegetable Rebellion. Yeah, and he just told me that it was the most horrific thing he'd ever been involved with, but that it was so terrible that you can't possibly miss it. And I, I made a point of going out and seeing that one. He was great. He was absolutely great. And so was McGowan. Yeah. Can you can you give us any, do you remember any specific details about what that was like? The McGowan thing? Yeah. Um, I remember that I told him that my favorite episode was one called The Schizoid Man. Oh, I love and that I later, one. I named a Star Trek episode, The Skin Sword Man, just as an homage to it, basically. And uh, mm-hmm. we talked about that. We talked about um, where he came up with so many ideas that championed the individual versus the sort of the corporate conglomerate. Um, right. And he said that he started to get a sense back in the early 60s that everybody was starting to get uh, into the habit of losing their individual liberties and that it was very alarming to him and that when he uh, was offered the chance to do the series this is the prisoner he told them up front you know what I really want to make some statements about the way everyone's losing their individuality and he thought that they would try to clamp down on him and not let him do it but one thing we talked about, did you know that he was the original choice for James Bond? Yes, and he turned it yeah. down. Yeah, he turned it down. and uh, Because it was too, too violent? He couldn't kiss a woman on screen because he thought it was. Oh, it, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, he was a devout Roman Catholic or whatever. Right, um, yep. And uh, the, the coolest thing about it, Gil, was that here I am, like, pinching myself that he's, like, sitting across from me in my office. Right. And once I got on the phone with him later on and he, he sort of relaxed a little bit, he suddenly was just open. He wasn't, you know, weird about you anything. You disarmed him. He really was cool. I mean, I really, I was, I was so in awe of him as an artist, you know, that... Um, I was just eating every minute of it up because uh, I realized that this was a once in a lifetime thing. And, it, and needless to say, I never saw him again after that. So I, mm-hmm. I think he probably died pretty soon after. Um, wow. 
you know, when I was at Saturday Night Live, I spent the same kind of time with Michael Palin of Monty Python. No and way. I was able to, oh, yeah. I was able to, again, spend a couple hours with him. And he was so cool. He used to, he'd get up, I'd be talking about a sketch that I love. He'd be getting up and kind of acting it out in the room, which was just unbelievable. So Wow. Those, those that is crazy. Great. Yeah. I worked with Bob Dylan. That was another one on that scale. So, what? Uh, yeah. You never told me that. For six months, yeah. Uh, please, yeah, do stuff, tell. A lot of stuff that's not in my bio. Um, he was interested in doing a movie about Buddy Rich, the jazz drummer. And mm -hmm. uh, so we we went to different studios and tried to get it off the ground as a movie. And amazingly, a lot of the studio executives didn't really seem to care about who Bob Dylan was. So it never really flew. And mm. uh, we never made it. But I did work with him for about six months. It's pretty amazing, too. Uh, yeah. I'm uh, putting up uh, images of... Uh, things that you've written or been a part of. Uh, and uh, since Matthew McConaughey is on the screen, I, I feel imperative that I must say, hey, hey, hey. Sorry, you're breaking <laughs> up a little bit. Oh, I was just saying that uh, I'm, I've been putting up images of uh, things that you've been involved in writing and and uh, mm -hmm. uh, now that uh, Matthew McConaughey is on the screen, I feel obliged to say, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> That's I heard like he's his little after catchphrase. Did you hear that? The governor. Really? Yeah, he's definitely considering it right now. He was quoted yesterday about it. About what? He says he's going to possibly run for governor of Texas. As a centrist. Oh, wow. That's what he said. He'd win in a heartbeat. Gil, you're breaking up. I kind of can't hear you. I said he'd win in a heartbeat. All I heard was I said. I couldn't hear anything after that. He would yeah, win that. in a heartbeat. That's cool, but that's got nothing to do with me, does it? Uh, what is that object? That's From uh, the, the the device that uh, Jody Foster got in. It was uh, built yeah, from the plans terrible. sent by the aliens. I do see something spinning. Maybe you should um, move your your phone. Is the charge okay? I know you're saying something. I can hear your voice, but I can't make up words. I will um, endeavor to post a message then. Oh, is that is that interference coming from Tracy? I think so. Oh, what's that? The way things are going, that might be your next neighbor. Hmm. That was funny. I heard that. <laughs> Can we hear you now? It sounds like there are audio issues on your end. Maybe if you move around the room. Yeah, there you go. I'll have to come in again. I'll have to wait. Yeah. Um, I got to tell you, uh, uh, Tracy is a fascinating guy. He is. And uh, Slider Fan Blog, Slider Fan Blog says it's NSA interference. 
they don't want us to talk to Tracy. Uh, it could be coming from the aliens. Live at the Love Shack. That's true. Hey, Love uh, Shack. I see God you trolling knows. me, Love Shack. God only knows uh, why and from where the interference is coming. It's probably because he lives on the top of a mountain. Uh, after they got out of L.A., they did a similar Cal exit thing uh, to Gary, uh, except they, they didn't leave the state. They they moved from L.A. to the top of this mountain. And uh, you would think the top of the mountain would be the perfect place to get a good signal and all that, but apparently not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Live at the Love Shack says, "Did you try to turn the turn the Stargate off and on again?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty uh, funny. Yeah, I heard some oh, fun, you know very what? funny comments of you from you, Love Shack, this week. Uh, go ahead, Gil. Now this is a perfect time to change the background. What do you think about this one? Uh, sure. Or I lots like of I lots like of the, little ones. I like the one you had up before, but. But what this one? Oh, I really this like one? this. I really, I like this one. Or but this I really one? like the blue one, the the other one. That one. I, I really like this one, but it's up to you. Well, it goes really well with your channel. My channel has a, a green thing going on. Oh, okay. If, yeah, do whatever. If you, you notice, do. our our names are in green. Yeah, you're right. Um. So what's so uh, in, what intensified? What's, what's coming up says, on your channel? Fans have made present-day comparisons to the Sliders episode Fever, where everyone is paranoid about getting sick. It would be interesting to hear Tracy's thought on that, science fiction becoming reality. Actually, um, intensified, that happens quite a lot, um, especially with good literary science fiction. Uh, it's part of a science fiction writer's job, uh, being one, I know this, uh, to accurately extrapolate the future from the present. Um, for instance, uh, I consider myself a hard science fiction writer. So while I'm writing, I have a, a search window open. So I, I'm constantly checking the science and looking at the newest thing, you know, while I'm writing. And uh, it doesn't uh, trip me up at all. As a matter of fact, it's it's perfect because it gives me a little break from writing, so I can read, and then I can incorporate that into the story. Um, you know, when you write every day and and you become a professional writer, uh, things like that aren't as difficult as they might sound. And live with the love shack says, I would love to say. Uh, C, Tracy Torme Sliders was a Stargate ripoff and may can prove me right. Unfortunately, actually, uh, Live at the Love Shack, Sliders predates Stargate. So, sorry about that. Let's see here. No, I've lost my co-host. And while I'm solo, we'll read some chats. Uh, T and Telly with Maria. Thanks for being here. Um, that's my fave. Intensified says, interesting. Thanks for the response. You're welcome. Uh, I wasn't referring to the movie. I, I was referring to the TV show, which is loosely based on the movie and uh really uh kind of blew the movie out of the water in, in my likely opinion so um 
I will counter your checkmate with a double checkmate. Tracy got the idea from a magazine about the Revolutionary War for Sliders. Uh, Sliders fan blog, can you please uh, uh, elucidate and uh, tell us more about that? That's the first I've heard of that. I would be very interested to hear more. Loosely based? What the fuck? Says Live at the Love Shack. And uh, I appreciate everybody uh, hanging in there who's uh, waiting for uh, Tracy's return. I sent him a text about uh, if he's going to... Uh, rejoin and he must be having technical difficulties he has not replied so we shall see in any case I am here as your host and it is my job to entertain you and if you have found this entertaining, because the Stream Elements bot is here, but the Stream Elements tip chart is not, if you would like to uh, tip me or buy me a coffee, etc., you can do so here. This is my personal PayPal link. It's 100%. Secure, I don't get any of your credit card information or anything like that. And, uh, you know, all those other YouTubers have fancy tip jars and super chats and all that kind of thing. And I'm still uh, winging my way past 350 uh, uh, subscribers. So if you enjoy this content and... Uh, you, you'd like to see more, please subscribe. And, uh, and please hit that uh, notification bell uh, on, on Thursdays from 7 to 9 p.m. I do a show called Into the Fringe. And I interview every week a different um, expert, uh, researcher, author, what have you. Uh, mostly about UFOs, but also cryptozoology and all kinds of other paranormal stuff. Uh, and uh, we do that every week. On Mondays, we do Masters of the Genre, although we usually do it with people that have uh, better internet connections than those people living on the top of a mountain. Um, then... There's Cardinal Sin and Friends on Sundays, which is my panel show where I have other YouTubers on and I, uh, I go, the show is supposed to go from three to 5 PM, but it actually ended up being like six and a half hours. And once we went eight and a half hours, so, um, there's that. Um, occasionally I do a show called Midnight to Midnight where I just kind of feel like bitching about whatever I'm currently bitching about. Uh, but it, if you really want to see me, you know, go off the hook, I have a show called Cardinal Sin Rants. And I've only done it twice. But when I get really mad at what's going on in pop culture, things that we were discussing earlier, the woke agenda, the, the uh, identity politics and all that, uh, then Cardinal Sin Rants is my jam. Uh, I do unboxing videos and almost every day, I try and do it every day, I have a show called Just a Minute. 
Uh, it's about my geek collector's treasures. And I share something every day uh, that's 60 seconds or less, which is part of uh, YouTube's uh, plan. It's a beta to help uh, smaller channels get recognized. If you, uh, you know, do this every day for two weeks, uh, your channel is suggested much more than it would be normally. So I do that. So please do subscribe. Uh, there's lots of great contact, uh, content rather, sorry. And, uh, I, I would certainly appreciate it and uh, tell all your friends and even the people you hate, uh, you know, getting subscribers and 4,000 hours of watch time is difficult. And I end up between the shows that I'm on uh, that other YouTubers do. Uh, I, I, I spend quite a deal of time uh, live streaming. Um, and, and releasing uh, videos. So uh, I just need more eyes on what I do. Uh, Sliders fan blog. If I remember correctly, the magazine either asked the question, what if George Washington died or Tracy got the idea of looking at it and gave him the idea how America would be different. What if? He mentions it in the making of sliders on DVD. Those are fighting words. I must have missed the fighting words. For all that matter, I claim to say sliders is a ripoff in Stargate in jest. It's meant to be a joke in order to promote discussion and debate about the matter. And those are fighting words and a smiley face. Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, a good lighthearted discussion is much, much more uh, uh, important than, uh, you know, those are fighting words type, you know, debates where, you know, you know, an argument is not just the, the gainsaying of uh, the opposite, uh, you know, point of what your, your, the other person in the argument is saying. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Are you here for the f half hour argument or, or the full hour? Oh, just the half hour. No, you're not. I love those old Monty Python skits. Those are great. Um, did I try bringing strippers to my show? No, uh, although uh, apparently there are portions of YouTube where that sort of thing uh, doesn't get you uh bounced uh my my channel is mostly about uh pop culture genre fiction science fiction uh because i'm a screenwriter and editor a science fiction writer um soon to be publisher i have a, an anthology coming out which is really great uh but uh the strippers kind of outside the lines, you know, in my coloring book. So, but thanks for asking. Well, I guess it looks like, um, let's see, Robin says, hi, Gil's, uh, Tracy's phone died even though it was plugged in. He should be back in about five minutes. No, oh, good. And that was it. 8.49, it's 8.54 now, so, not long, I appreciate your patience, thank you, um, and if you're unfamiliar with my content, uh, take this opportunity to have a look at the different playlists in my channel, the different shows, uh, the, the most recent shows, actually, in the last week or two have been great. Uh, my content is really, uh, you know, raising the roof. So, 
Um, do you have a look around if you're new? If you're not, have a look around anyway. Um, I'm a, I'm a pretty funny guy. I, I tend to be a, a social animal, even over the internet, uh, live streaming. So uh, I am here to entertain you uh, with interviews uh, on the caliber of Tracy Torme and uh, Mark Scott Zacree, uh, one of the episodes of Masters of the Genre that we did not too long ago was with Tessa B. Dick, the uh, widow of Philip K. Dick. And she has a YouTube channel. Uh, and I contacted her and we talked about her books. And we talked about uh, Philip K. Dick's books. And uh, very interesting. She's a, a really, really interesting lady. She taught uh, English for 12 years got a master's degree. Uh, she ended up writing a short story and showing it to Philip K. Dick, who encouraged her to keep writing. And she actually helped him co-write uh, through a scanner darkly and Vallis. Uh, she edited and, and maybe wrote the end of those books or, or just helped write them in general. I don't remember exactly. Um, if Tracy gets back, please ask him about the sliders peacock talks. He was cut off with the stream issue. I will do so. Uh, sliders fan blog live at the love shack trolling me yet again. What if Cardinal sin replaced Phil Collins as Genesis lead drummer? Uh, I would only ever do that if um, Peter Gabriel would would come back. Um, what if Sliders lasted for 10 seasons plus two spinoff series like Stargate? That's a really interesting concept uh, to think about. Um, I, I think that's what Tracy is trying to do. Uh, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. He is trying to bring Sliders back with as much of the original cast as he can. I guess the, uh, the gal that played the, uh, the young lady in the original series uh, isn't acting anymore, so she won't be returning. But uh, that doesn't mean that we won't see the crying man Jerry O'Connell. Uh, Tracy said he'd been in talks with John Reese Davies. Davis, sorry. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that's uh, really possible, especially at this point, because let's face it, uh, science fiction uh, and and genre fiction TV shows and movies kind of have slid off the rails at this point. And uh, having somebody like Tracy Torme bring back uh, a much beloved franchise like uh, Sliders uh, is the perfect thing. Because like I said, he would, as long as he was behind the, the steering wheel, uh, it would never be woke. It would it would be good science fiction, interesting, uh, you know, uh, television again or streaming or whatever. And um, uh, I don't know about spinoffs of Sliders. I, I, there's only one, you know, remote control. So I guess uh, the Jerry O'Connell character would have to uh, build more of those or maybe somebody, maybe somebody would slide in. You know, while they're where they ended up sliding to, and another team of sliders slides in, that would be kind of interesting. I don't know if uh, they ended up doing that or not. Uh, Live at the Love Shack says, "What if PJ Orville Nation became a successful YouTube channel the size of Doomcock?" Well, that would be great. I think uh, 
PJ would would really like having uh, a uh, a channel that big. That's uh, one of the reasons that we're going to be doing the Friendathon this year, and the Friendathon is where a channel like uh, uh, PJ's Orville Nation or mine. Cardinal Sin channel, youtube.com slash Cardinal Sin, by the way, easy to find. Uh, we're going to get together and have, you know, people that are on the lower tiers of, of YouTube that don't have, uh, that haven't been monetized yet. They don't have a uh, thousand subscribers like Clobber and Times just got. Welcome. Good job. Congratulations. Mazel tov to Clobber and Times. Mike is uh, a very capable YouTuber. You're always in good hands at his channel. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, the best way to raise attention about one's YouTube channel on YouTube is to go onto other people's panels. And people that weren't familiar with you before will become familiar with you and they will either like you or dislike you or not care. But if they like you, they'll go to your channel and subscribe. And uh, Doomcock has graciously uh, told people to subscribe to my channel many times. Um, as well as, I think, Robert Meyer Burnett who are both uh, sort of uh, heroes of mine. Uh, very talented guys. Very, very funny, very interesting. Uh, Intensified says, I agree, at Slider's fan blog. Live at the Love Shack, what if Jon Snow didn't bend the knee to Daenerys Targaryen? It sounds to me like you have a lot of good uh, fan fiction stories in you, Live at the Love Shack. Uh, you might want to you might want to start writing these down. Well, I mean, you are writing them down. But what if Orville season three didn't get canceled three times already, and we already had watched seasons three and four, and we're waiting for season th five in, instead? I uh, I'll, I'll do my best to answer that. Uh, in sort of a, a guesstimate way because I don't know the facts. Uh, I do know that uh, Seth MacFarlane marched over to CBS with uh, his posse and uh, they had a two-hour meeting scheduled to discuss buying Star Trek from CBS, which they would never do because it's the flagship of their streaming service, their old streaming service, their new streaming service. They even uh, played an episode of Star Trek Discovery on on CBS proper. So they took it from behind a paywall and we were able to see the, the 48 hour ratings and they were laughable. It was really, uh, really bad. Um, Sliders fan blog says, I think a mini series is better suited for Sliders. That way it doesn't get woke and ruined by the executives. Well, it's funny you say that, uh, Sliders fan blog. Um, a, a streaming service like, say, Amazon, uh, who is coming out with their Lord of the Rings Second Age uh, show apparently is quite woke. They hired an intimacy coordinator um, and uh, because Tolkien was a devout Roman Catholic, not just a Roman Catholic, but a devout Roman Catholic. Uh, I don't think there needs to be any intimacy that's not in the source material, but Jeff Bezos said, and I will quote, I want a game of Thrones, unquote. And of course, the nearest thing is Lord of the Rings. And 
three you know Peter Jackson movies were quite successful depending on uh, how you look at success it was uh, well received by the fans made a lot of money saved Miramax because uh, they gambled on doing all three movies at the same time in fact uh, when he pitched he was pitching for two movies and the guy that he ended up talking to last because he'd gone through all the other studios in Hollywood uh, at Miramax said isn't Lord of the Rings a trilogy and so thus was born the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings where there's I don't know if there, there's sexual intimacy there's there's romance certainly but uh, I, I think uh, Jeff Bezos wants you know the kind of Game of Thrones like Game of Thrones was with plenty of nudity and violence and uh, there's just not really any call for that kind of thing um, I I remember reading The Hobbit and then later Lord of the Rings uh, every year when I was a kid and uh, there's definitely no nudity. In fact, uh, you can't tell dwarvish women from men. They look pretty much the same, unless you're a dwarf, I suppose. Okay, uh, Live at the Love Shack. What if PJ Orville Nation didn't have a crappy internet connection? Uh, I think he has a good uh, internet connection. Um, I don't know why he uh, isn't back, but uh, he does live in Spain, so it's getting really late there, and he, he uh, already streamed today. And again, live the Love Shack intimacy coordinator for Lord of the Rings. That's insane. You better Fifty Shades pour from Tom and Jerry or Scooby-Doo. I... I, man, I, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, you're going to have to, uh, you're going to have to, you know, uh, tell me more. I, I, I don't quite understand where you're coming from. Uh, Orville Nation says, Gil, I have no internet connection all of a sudden. All right, well, my bad. Uh, sorry. Uh, that sucks. Did you unplug the Stargate and plug it back in? <laughs> mm. Live at the Love Shack. If you can get a boner from reading Tolkien, you must be a pervert. Yep. Yes, we have lost Tracy. Although, uh, right about now, according to Robin, uh, he should be coming back. So, let me check. Let's see, uh, there are any other notices that I missed? One moment, please. There. Uh, you see, I told you so. Says Life at the Love Shack. Sliders fan blog says, Sliders was a show that the entire family could watch. A witty, intelligent show. No need for sex and violence. Execs think that sex and violence equals money. Some do. Like at HBO. Or Showtime. Um, not all of them, of course. Joe Wilde says, Sliders was 1995. Stargate movie came out in 1994. Uh, that, that's true. However, uh, Tracy was creating the show at that time. I, I don't think it's... Uh, uh, accurate to say that Sliders ripped off Stargate. 
it's it's actually a lot closer to Star Trek because instead of having the you know the Enterprise uh, go to a different planet every week, um, they just have the wormhole take them to a different planet every week. It's it's virtually the same scenario. And Joe Wilde vindicates me. Thank you, sir. Well, there you go. Yeah. It's probably a parallel evolution, I would say. Uh, that kind of thing happens in science fiction all the time, actually. In books, film, movies, TV, you know, all that stuff. Um, I've, I've noticed that almost every idea I've had for an invention has been done by the time I think of it, someone else has brought it to market. There are a few inventions that I came up with that that wasn't the case for, but I, I didn't want to hire a $600 an hour patent lawyer to find out because I, I couldn't spend that kind of money. Intensified says, I'd hope if Slider returned, it could maintain the intelligence and wit of the first and second seasons and not be an action show. I agree. And I think that's exactly what Tracy wants to do. Live at the Love Shack. Cardinal Sin is a hermit, Kermit ripoff. He's just white and human with no puppeteers attached. You are wise beyond your years. Live at the Love Shack. Let's see. Did I get a reply? I didn't. Well, there's uh, seven people still in the audience. Uh, we've gone past our two hours by uh, 12 minutes and 25 seconds. Uh, as long as you guys are uh, happy to sit here and wait for them to reconnect, I am. Although, personally, I think at this point it's probably a wash whether uh, Tracy will reconnect. I am going to have Tracy on Inside the Fringe soon because uh, he's written documentaries, UFO documentaries, and uh, knows so much about the, the field. Uh, we'll definitely have him on again. And who knows, we might talk more sliders as, you know, things uh, roll, roll along. So uh, Joe Wild says I agree too. Slider's fan blog. Tracy mentioned the silhouette run scene of Slider was an homage to the 1978 Invasion of the Body Snatchers remake. I didn't catch that. And Joe Wilde says, It's good to have plot and urgency towards a climax, but we want to see the human drama of it, not explosions, explosions and bad CGI. I agree. And you see that. Definitely reminds me of the first Body Snatchers movie. They were both good. Uh, what, 1953 and 1978 or 1958 and 1973, something like that. Uh, Intensified says, I don't mind waiting a bit longer. I'm enjoying the, three, the stream. Thank you, Cardinal Sin. Well, thank you. I, uh, I hope, you know, man, I've been entertaining in some way. Uh, you know, just uh, a single YouTuber not not really interacting with anyone or anybody uh, on the panel, as it were, just in the chat. Never, never say bad things about people in the chat. Never do that. They're good people, good people in the, in the chat. And they'll come find where you live and kill you in your sleep. So, you know, just saying, wow, I know it's crazy. You're very welcome, Intensified. I do my best. Live at the Love Shack. Thank you, sir. I have the most deepest fear. I think he means the most deep fear and respect for the ancient drum foo masters in the high mountain. Well, I certainly do as well. 54 and 78. Yeah, off by a year. What do you want? What do you want? Wicca? Let's see if I have any other 
Interesting stuff. I had one question left. Tell us about the time you and Joseph Stefano were in a meeting with the studio executive about bringing back the new Outer Limits. And that was a, uh, a question that I knew the answer to. You know what they say about lawyers. Never ask a question you don't already know the answer to. Uh, well, I uh, had a, a rather long phone call with Tracy the other day. And he told me exactly uh, what happened. And it's uh, really uh, unfortunate. Um, the executive, the guy in the suit, was too young to know that Joseph Stefano was the other guy who wasn't Tracy on the other side of his desk. And when they suggested making a new Outer Limit series, he said, oh, what, you mean that old one from the 60s? That piece of trash? And, of course, the creator was sitting right there and I'm sure was very offended. Or just, you know, did a face palm and was like kids these days. You know, who knows? Uh, I will say one thing. Hollywood is a lot less ageist than it used to be. Uh, it used to be, you know, actors, movie stars had a sell-by date. You know, once you got old and wrinkled, you weren't really interesting anymore. And um, that's no longer the case. You know, you see movies like Red uh, with Helen Mirren and, uh, you know, all these older actors still, you know, kicking ass, doing great action movies, if that's your thing. If that is your thing, you know, I like action movies as much as the next guy. Maybe more. But um, uh, if you look at uh, the James Bond movies, uh, the lady that played M, I can't believe I don't remember her name. I'm a huge fan of hers. Uh, she was, you know, in that franchise for years and years and years. And, uh, she's still acting. Uh, John Cleese was Q for a few movies. And he was Judy Dench. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Joe Wilde says... There was a slider spoof on the Funnier Die YouTube back in 2013 where Jerry goes around asking for money to fund the Sliders movie that never happened. Was that actually with Jerry O'Connell or was it just a guy playing Jerry O'Connell? What if Christopher Walken was the cardinal sin and vice versa? Well, then you'd have somebody that doesn't have really any kind of weird or wicked voice and dramatic pauses being in movies that he's not talented enough to, to carry. Although I have been in three movies and, and while I've, I've been an actor and I'm a screenplay writer, I don't think that anybody would want to imitate me. And on the other hand, the other part of your question, what you know, if the roles were reversed and you'd have a guy on YouTube that nobody understands why he sounds like he sounds, it just wouldn't make any sense. It's 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 crazy. Live at the Love Shack says, My greatest fear watching Westworld Season 1 was I received the news that Anthony Hopkins died before they finished filming. That's not true. He didn't die before they finished filming. And as far as I know, he's still alive. Uh, favorite Christopher Walken flick? The Prophecy, hands down. The Prophecy trilogy of movies are some of the best movies ever made. Uh... If you haven't seen the Prophecy movies, definitely see them in order. Uh, because the third movie kind of 
changes uh, everything and puts it on his ear. And then, you know, there's like Prophecy 4 and 5, and he's not in any of them, but, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend them as much as uh, uh, Prophecy 1 and 2. Um, Joe Wild, you can still catch it on YouTube. Search Sliders the movie. That would have sucked, though. Tensified. Nice. Thank you. Live the Love Shack. I know that, but I fear that could have happened during filming. Well, rest assured, uh, it did not happen during filming. As far as I know, Anthony Hopkins is still alive, still acting. Um, I thought you were going to mention, you know, how awful season two was compared to season one and how awful season three was compared to season two and how it just became a huge woke world. That's what they should have called it. Um, I, I actually stopped watching, uh, Westworld because Doomcock, uh, had very negative things to say about it and he is sort of my my uh friend with really good taste in in films and and in tv streaming uh he uh, he and gary beagler uh, are kind of the the gatekeepers for me where you know they they watch something they really don't want to watch like star trek discovery or uh bat Whammon or you know whatever and uh, I know I don't need to watch those movies because they've already taken the hit for me. And I don't have to pollute my head with that nonsense. Uh, I, I've been a big Whovian all my life. I'm, I'm really destroyed by the fact that they destroyed Doctor Who. Uh, I've always been a Star Trek fan. Uh, I'm a Trekker as opposed to a Trekkie. Trekkie is someone who got into the fad of being into Star Trek. Trekker is someone that's lifelong, like I am. Um, so, seeing you know my my uh, beloved franchises and modern myths uh, get infected with this woke crap is just—it's uh, very easy for me just to ignore it and pretend that nobody watched it because very few people actually did. Joe Wild, man, that show really did crash and burn, huh? Glad I never bothered to watch the other seasons. Yeah, totally. In Doomcock, we trust. Uh, hashtag Doomcock was right. Right? He's, uh... He knows which way the wind is blowing. And, and Disney have people whose job it is to listen to his live streams. Uh, he's been told, you know, Disney is uh, having people listen to the fans to see what the fans want. Uh, and I don't know if you know, I don't know if you, you've heard about this, but uh, Doomcock's most recent video uh, was a rumor from one of his sources whose rumors end up being like 90% true. And this uh, person who's very close to the production said that uh, Alex Kurtzman asked for uh, the season four of Discovery to be split into two halves, which is kind of the popular thing these days. And... Um, they gave him the money for both, and he spent all of it on the first half of season four, and it's going to go away now that Kurtzman is uh, no longer welcome. Secret Hideout will no longer be making Star Trek, and there was much rejoicing, but we'll have to see how that shakes out. Uh, what 
if a young Cardinal Sin replaced the young Keith or Sutherland in The Lost Boys. I'm, I'm just not that good an actor. I'm, I'm not as good as Keith or Sutherland, uh, surely. Uh, don't call me Shirley. I know. Um, Sliders fan blog. I don't know if a lot of people know, but there were 10 comic book issues of Sliders. I did not know that. Were they written by, by Tracy? Or was he overseeing that? Live at the Love Shack. There are no superhero movie or TV shows available on TV or streaming that Axel Brown didn't better. I'll take your word for it. As a fellow Trekker, Intensified says, it's really hard to see what's happened to the franchise. It sounds silly to say, but I really do find it heartbreaking, even though it doesn't actually impact my life. Man, you said a mouthful, Intensified. That's exactly right. Um, it doesn't actually impact my life, but it breaks my heart. Uh, Doctor Who is dead. Never return. Uh, the only thing that could possibly work for uh, Doctor Who is for it to take another 18-year hiatus, which I uh, uh, recommend for Star Wars as well. Joe Wilde says, Kurtzman will just infect something else. Oh, like Clarice that went for one season and got canceled? Sliders Comics. I know, right? Totally cool. Very cool. Sliders comics would be a-okay with me in a world where sliders went off the air and became a comic. People read them. And that's about as far as I can make it with my in a world. In a world where two kingdoms are split in half, rent asunder, because one princess marries a different prince than the one her father arranged for. Well, it'd just be a bad political move, I suppose. You know, most of the time when when uh, nobility and, uh, and uh, royalty got married, it was to gain allies or start or stop a war, uh, get extra supplies, money, etc., Uh, Sliders Fan Blog says, The Sliders comic book Blood and Splendor was written by Tracy. Narcotica was written by Jerry O'Connell. Oh, that's cool. Intensified says, I'm checking eBay right now for those Sliders comics at Sliders Fan Blog. Please do tell us the results. Uh, I won't compete. I don't have money to spend on, on Sliders comics. But uh, do tell us what you find. Live at the Love Shack. As in... <clears throat> sorry. As an interdimensional cable TV expert, I can easily say that in other parallel timelines, Cardinal Shirley has the same acting talent as Cardinal Sin. They just follow different paths in life. I, I don't know who Cardinal Shirley is. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm confused. I, I, I don't know. Um, I'm lost. But uh, I'm typically lost. Uh, when I've only had an hour and a half or two hours of sleep after 60 hours of being awake uh, involuntarily. I, uh, I started a uh, one of the sublingual kinds of melatonin because they didn't have the capsules that I usually take at the store. And it turns out you really do have to put them under your tongue for them to work. Uh, also, check out Sliders Trading Cards that were released in 1997. Wow. You guys know a lot about Sliders. I guess that's why you're the Sliders fan blog, huh? Okay, uh, ladies and gents, uh, cats and dogs, uh, however you identify across these 28 known galaxies, uh, I am going to go ahead and sign off. We are half an hour past uh, the allotted time, so... Uh, I appreciate everyone hanging around uh, and being here. Again, please subscribe. Uh, hit that like button. Leave a comment down below. Uh, YouTube really digs the engagement with uh, uh, channels that aren't monetized yet. So 
I would really appreciate some love. Uh, if you don't like what I do, the comments are a perfect place to tell me what I did wrong. And Sliders Fan Vlog says, thank you for hosting. And thank you, Tracy. You're very welcome. And like I said, we'll have Tracy back on for sure. And we'll probably have him back on Masters of the Genre because, you know, he he didn't fulfill his his agreement. It, you know, was just, it, it's a two-hour show. It's not like uh, he committed or, you know, signed a contract. You are too modest. These shows are too short. Well, go back uh, and watch yesterday's uh, Cardinal Sin and Friends, my panel show. We went six plus hours, as we normally do on Sundays. And do please check out my other material. I have a, a growing library of really interesting material. Shows are just getting better and better, uh, in my humble opinion. Uh, a professional comedian never laughs at his own jokes. And I'm not a professional comedian. But the analog I'm trying to make is that one should probably never talk up one's own YouTube channel as being really great. Although, I happen to think mine is really great. But that's because I'm me. You, you, you may, you know, your my, my mileage may vary. I don't know. Uh, intensified. Thank you for the stream and for bringing Tracy here. One big question I wanted to know if the series would be filmed in Vancouver again. LOL. Hmm. Well, I don't think it would be filmed in Georgia. Let's put it that way. And we know how fucked up Hollywood is right now. So, yeah, I'd say there's a good chance. Why not? And on that note, I'm going to sign off. It's Cardinal Sin.